And I'm pleased to welcome to the show Emily Oster, Brown University Professor of Economics, famed economist to me, particularly new mums, new dads who depend on your books to delve into the data around parenting, expecting better, crib sheet. I've lost count of how many books I've bought for others that you've written. But delve into the data for us now, Emily, about the risks and rewards to decision making for parents right now. Your piece in Bloomberg Opinion outlining some of the options, imperfect as they may be, that parents can use to educate their kids right now. How are you trying to strike a balance between socialization on the one hand and safety on the other? Yeah, I think this is really challenging. And I think that what you just, the, the statement that we just heard about the, um, the resources is really real. Like we need to, if we're gonna open schools, we need to be able to do it safely. Uh, at the moment, it seems like kids are relatively low risk uh, relative to adults of, of COVID, but that doesn't necessarily mean that schools themselves are at low risk. And if we are going to reopen safely, we need a tremendous amount of additional resources and honestly creative thinking. Um, what I was writing in, in Bloomberg was really about how parents can think about using some of that kinds of creative thinking in the case in which their school is not open all the time, which it seems like increasingly many school districts will have a partial model. Uh, and so helping parents think about, you know, what kind of childcare options do you have and what kind of homeschooling options are we likely to have as we move uh, as we move through the next year. So, Emily, what, what then are some of those options? I mean, for some of us, we're already sort of looking towards a school year that probably won't be complete or in full. There'll be some sort of truncated uh, return. Uh, so at the end of the day, the parents uh, are going to have to be at home with their kids in some form or another and probably going to have to be teaching them in some form or another. How do you do that? Yeah, so I think that, you know, one option is to do it to do it yourself, I guess, um, which is what we all did in the in the spring. I think that that's likely to be very challenging for a lot of families. It was already challenging. It's likely to become more challenging in the fall when employers are more likely to expect people to be back at work. Uh, one of the kinds of um, solutions that I articulated is uh, uh, getting together with other families whose kids are uh, with your kid, who, for example, other kids in your kid's class. Uh, and perhaps sharing some of the burden of being home with the kids or even hiring, say, a babysitter or a college student, somebody to do some supervision of, of distance learning. That's not a perfect solution uh, and is a solution that costs money, but it's cheaper than a solution like hire your own governess. Um, so my guess is we'll see some parents you know, try to make use of, of solutions like that, try to just, to just make it work. We have a little bit more warning than we did in the spring, so maybe that will be helpful in, in facilitating some of this. Emily, one of my bigger concerns about this younger generation is they were already falling behind in the rigor of the math, the science, the economics relative to some other countries. How much further does this now create a gap in how far behind we are falling? Yeah, so I mean, I think that the, the biggest concern is really about the inequality within the U.S. I think these questions of, you know, how do we compare to, to Europe, I would almost put aside in, in the moment. But one of the things we saw in the spring is when we look at some of these metrics of how much math are kids learning, we saw that particularly for kids in low-income schools, the drop-off in how many, you know, math activities they completed was, was tremendous, much, much larger than in higher-income schools. So we're already... When we think about the summer, we already think about the summer slump and the summer slump promoting inequality. This is a sort of like extreme version of that. I do think as we move to the fall, there are opportunities for us to do better with distance learning. So it's it's not that there are no online options that are that are good. You know, we have things like Lexia, like Zern, these online solutions. We just need to find a way to make those possible for for kids particularly for low-income kids who may not have as many people at home to supervise, to help them, uh, and may not have as good access to the internet or computers. Emily, I'm pretty sure that the data right now is too early, too raw, but you in your books, particularly Crib Sheet, lay out perhaps some of the balancing act when you're a working parent of whether you want nanny versus daycare and what socialization impact that might have. And in the longer term, you came to the conclusion that it didn't have much long-term impact from a social perspective for a child. What do you think the damage might be to what is happening right now in terms of socialization of certain age groups and what this means in the longer term for children? You know, I think it's very hard hard to tell people keep asking me this, like, is my kid going to be OK? Are they? And the answer is, like, most of what we know from these other settings would say that there are a lot of different ways to socialize your kid, that 
don't have very systematic uh, positive or negative impacts. So kids who are in daycare, kids who have a nanny, end up in a sort of similar setting. Having said that, you know, we've never tried this kind of grand experiment. And it is clearly the case that kids need some kinds of socialization. Um, I unfortunately, I think basically we're going to have to wait two decades to, to find out the impacts of that, which uh, is, is kind of a long time so, in the space of this pandemic. So, Emily, we only have about a minute or so left. I mean, as an economist, and you take a look at uh, the, the general slowdown in the economy that uh, is not only attributable to people not being at work, but, of course, uh, the connection there with schools, daycare, and all the like being folded into that. Um, is there any way that you can sort of quantify the potential impact if we don't get back up and running uh, in the fall? I am sure that people can do this. I think it's very hard. Uh, it's very hard to think about the the size of this in some very in some very precise way. I think you want to think about you know if half of the the lack of recovery for female labor force participation is something people have tried uh, have have tried to quantify, but I think we're a long way from being able to put numbers on that.